Hi, this is Professor Fernandez, and this is the lesson, the video from module one in lesson 12. So this lesson is about double and triple integrals in polar and spherical coordinates. The first module that we'll talk about in this video uh, is going to introduce you to spherical coordinates, and I will also review polar coordinates. There is much more detail in both of these, for both of these coordinate systems, actually, in your textbook. So I'm just going to give you the fundamentals for both. I'm going to emphasize the spherical coordinates because that's probably the new stuff for you. Um, you should have seen polar coordinates back in Calculus 1 or Calculus 2. Sometimes it may also be covered in a pre-calculus course. So I'm going to spend less time on that, but again, I just want to review the fundamentals of these. So polar coordinates, remember that this is a way to take a point that is plotted in a Cartesian coordinate system and think of it as instead of x comma y, r comma theta, where r is the distance from the origin and theta is the angle measured from the positive x axis, so counterclockwise. One thing to remember about polar coordinates, just like in Cartesian coordinates, you can have positive x and y values, you know, in all sorts of mixes here. And really these mean, you know, go to the left from the origin, and this means go down from the y axis. You can similarly have positive and negative values for polar coordinates, uh, coordinates, and these all mean different things. So again, just to review what they mean by way of example, this point here means um, go two units away from the origin and at an angle of pi over four from the positive x-axis. So there's my point. Um, this one says go two units away from the origin at an angle of negative pi over four. So I'm going down that way. So measuring the angle in the opposite direction, clockwise direction. This one over here, this negative, um, tells you that first I will go pi over four away from the x-axis, and then I will go two units away from the origin, and that's where I would have ended up, but then the negative tells me flip it around. So this is the point I end up in, right? So this is, you know, uh, 180 degrees from the point I was at and still two units away. And then this last one is, you know, getting uh, fun with negatives here. Um, I go minus pi over four, so I go down here, and then I go two units away, so I'm over here, two units away, and then this negative, flip it, so go 180 degrees, and still my two units away, so I end up over here. Okay, so this is a very, very quick review of how, just like over here, having negative numbers pop up in different places affects where you end up plotting your point in polar coordinates. Um, and then remember that from our uh, re uh, representation here of polar coordinates, if you look up here, we can draw a right triangle. We have this nice little right triangle where we have R as the hypotenuse, X as the base, Y as the height, and then theta as this angle. From here, you can look at all the trigonometric ratios, for example, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So you can use this to solve for x. That relates x to r and theta. You can do a similar thing with sine theta, opposite over hypotenuse. And you can also do tangent theta. So that is opposite over adjacent. Okay, so I have actually put all of those over here in this little box. So if you know the r and theta values of a polar coordinate point, then you can put them in these formulas and out will pop the x and y values. So that is converting from polar to rectangular coordinates. If you want to convert the other way around, that means that you know the x and y values, you know the x and y values, and we're going to convert to the r and theta values. How would you do that? Well, the first thing to know is that, uh, well, maybe not the first thing, but if you look at this equation, if you know the theta value, right, then, or sorry, if you know the x and y values, then you know tangent of theta. Maybe tangent of theta is, you know, uh, one. And then to solve for theta, then you could solve this for theta using the arctangent or the inverse tangent thing. thing. Um, and then how would you solve for r? Well, going back to our, our <laughs> triangle here, 
using our Pythagorean theorem, we know that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. And that gets us down here. So this is the box that then tells us how to convert from rectangular to polar. And the last thing that I will remind you of is just a very quick example. This has been just converting coordinates, polar and rectangular coordinates. I just want to remind you very quickly because we'll need some of this information for later on in this lesson, what graphs look like and how you graph functions in polar coordinates. So, oops, huh, that's interesting. Snap to shape. Um, so what I want to do there, very quick reminder, is just by way of an example. Let's try sketching the curve r equals 1 plus sine theta. Right? In Cartesian coordinates, if I ask you to sketch the curve y equals x squared plus 1, for example, we have some sense of what this looks like. This is a parabola that opens upward. Um, in polar coordinates, you know, I'm thinking now of r and theta. So this looks a little strange to uh, plot this way. And actually, this is if I literally replace the x and y axes with r and theta. Um, we generally don't do that. Generally, what we do is we keep this view, we just superimpose the r and theta view uh, on top of it, as I've been doing in this video. So let's just plot this by sketching a few values here. Um, and then we will see the nice little cardioid that results. So what if uh, theta equals zero? So if theta equals zero, then my r value sine of zero is zero, so I get r equals one. Um, what if theta equals pi over two? Well, sine of pi over two is one, so I get one plus one, r equals two. And then I'm just gonna go around. If theta equals pi, sine of pi is zero, so I'm back to one. Um, and then if theta is three pi over two, sine of three pi over two is negative one. And then I add this one here, I get r equals zero. Um, and then if I go down one more, back full revolution to 2 pi, sine of 2 pi is 0, so I get back to 1. So if I were to plot this, what are my points? Well, so there's, I'm going to try to make a little grid here, roughly to scale. Not quite exactly to scale, as you can see, but I've, I've tried. Um, <clears throat> so we start with, we're at the point, you know, um, r equals, uh, this first uh, point here in polar coordinates is theta equals zero, r equals one. So we're on the x-axis and we're a distance one away from it. So we're here, okay? And then we go to this second point here. This is pi over two and r equals two. So we're on the y-axis and up to two, there we are. And then here we're at theta equals pi, a distance one away from the origin, we're over there. And then here, three pi over two and we're at zero. And then here we're back to where we started. So it's not at all obvious that the curve I'm about to draw is the actual graph of this function. We would have to plot a few more points. But, you know, we started off going this direction and then we went this direction and then we ended up here and then we ended up here. Okay. So this is a very, very rough, rough sketch of what this cardioid looks like. And again, the intent is to just remind you of how you would plot functions in polar coordinates. Again, this is what we do in a, in a standard approach to this. Um, we plot points in what we normally think of as x comma y. However, we just take the information given to us in terms of r comma theta and convert it. r is a distance from the origin, as we said earlier. Theta is the angle measured from the positive x axis. So what I want to do now then is to tell you about spherical coordinates. Um, this is a very different coordinate system, although not, you know, completely, totally different, but it is, think of it as polar coordinates for three dimensions in the following sense. So if we are in three space now and we're thinking about spherical coordinates, well, normally a point here we think of as x comma y comma z. And we are gonna now think of it in this polar coordinate sense as this point has some distance from the origin. We're gonna call that rho. And this point is angled a little bit from the z, positive z axis. We're gonna call that angle phi. 
And then if we look at the projection onto the xy plane of this point, it has coordinates x, y, 0, because z is 0 of the xy plane, then that point is a, an angle theta away from the positive x-axis. And so we are then going to introduce our spherical coordinates as rho, the distance from the origin uh, that this point is. Then the next coordinate is theta, how far uh, angular speaking, angle speaking, away from the positive x-axis this point is on the xy plane, its, it's projection onto the xy plane. Uh, and then phi, how far away from the positive z-axis, you know, in terms of angular speak, this point is. Um, so that is our, our notation for this blue point here in polar coordinates. So next thing I want to do then is do what we had done earlier to relate x, y, and in this case z to rho, theta, and phi so we can convert back and forth between these. How do I do that? So I'm going to mention some geometric facts here and I'll, I'll just keep the triangle I have here. So we can think of rho here as, oops, make it try to more extend it to a line. We can think of this uh, rho, this distance as lying, as a line segment that lies on a line. Um, and we can then think of the z axis over here and this dotted line that I've drawn as two parallel lines. So we can think then of this, of this line that I'm doing here, uh, 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 touching here as a transversal. So back from geometry, this phi and this phi are the same in terms of their measure. So I'm gonna try to erase things that I'm not gonna use again later. So that was to get us phi inside that triangle, and I'll, I'll write it a little easier to see. Great, um, and then this is a right triangle. Why is it a right triangle? Well, this was the distance on the xy plane from the origin to the projection. Projection means I, I'm looking down. Here is my, my eye. I'm looking down this way um, from the point. So this, uh, this, vertical or this line segment here is perpendicular to the xy plane so hence the 90 degrees here all that matters because now i have a triangle a right triangle this one in black here where uh, i can also remember my y-axis disappeared i can also remember that um, the distance on the xy plane from the origin to a point that is a theta angle measure from the positive x-axis, we call that distance r. That's what we just talked about in polar coordinates. So it's in this sense that I mean that spherical coordinates is kind of like a three-dimensional version of polar coordinates. Um, rho plays much the same role, role as r. And theta is the same theta. And phi plays much the same role as theta does, except it's now with respect to the z-axis. Okay, so given everything we've talked about, how do we convert back and forth? Well, so remember it down here with this line segment, you know, if we look at the point on the plane, we're still in polar coordinate line. X is still R cosine theta. Y is still R sine theta. So that is still the same. Um, what has changed? Well, so now we have rho. Rho is distance from the origin. So remember the distance formula that we talked about, I believe, in the first or second lesson of this course. So that applies. That tells us how to relate x, y, and z to rho. Um, and then if we now look in this triangle, in this black triangle over here, right, um, I can remind you that this height here is z, right? That's where, where I'm indicating that this height is z. Um, so if I look at this, this triangle, if I pop it out over here, I have a height z triangle, I have a base r triangle, and the hypotenuse is rho, and then this angle up here is phi, and it's a right triangle. So now we can do all sorts of ratios. For example, cosine phi, oops, cosine of phi is adjacent over hypotenuse. So uh, z over rho. Sine phi is 
opposites over hypotenuse, so R over rho. So this allows me to solve for Z as rho cosine phi and R as rho sine phi. Okay, um, so this equation allows me to convert from rho phi to Z. Um, this one allows me to convert from rho phi to R. And over here, remember, we had a way to convert from R theta to X and Y. So I can, everywhere I see an R here, I can put in rho sine phi. And that will then give me what's down here. Here is the rho sine phi for X. And then another multiplicative constant of the usual cosine theta left over from the coordinates version, the polar coordinates version that we had talked about earlier in the video. Same thing for Y. So for Y, we have the rho sine phi, there it is, and then times sine theta. So that comes from over here. So that is my y. And then as we saw up here, rho cosine phi, that's my z. <clears throat> and then rho is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. This is the same relationship that we had from here for finding theta given x and y. And now we go back to this first equation up here, solve for cosine phi, and we can find uh, phi from z and rho. Okay, so uh, this then tells us everything we need to know uh, for how to convert from spherical to rectangular or rectangular to spherical. So these are the new set of formulas. And we will, you know, I'm gonna skip the graphing part for now. Um, I'm just gonna make some very simple observations about very simple graphs in spherical coordinates to get you used to what these coordinates look like. The more involved functions that we're going to graph in spherical coordinates, uh, we will get to that. Once we start integrating in spherical coordinates, we're going to have to sketch regions and, and uh, functions in spherical coordinates. So we'll get to that in that module. But for now, let me just give you some examples. So um, what if I plot rho equals one in spherical coordinates? Well, remember that rho is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So if rho equals one, then I'm plotting this in, sphere, in a rectangular coordinates. And that is the equation of the unit sphere with center at the origin. So you can see that, you know, there is a benefit to working in spherical coordinates rather than this being the equation of the unit sphere centered at the origin. This is the equation of the unit sphere centered at the origin, right? So that's my, this is going to be my very rough, quick sketch of the unit sphere centered at the origin. Um, so this is one example I wanted to mention. So what if I do something like theta equals pi over four? What if I plot that in spherical coordinates? Well, um, I'm, I'm not given a row value. So row can be every number that it can be, which is from zero all the way to infinity. I'm not giving a phi value. So phi can be any number that it can be. All I'm told is that all of the points lie an angle pi over four from the x-axis. Theta equals positive x-axis. Theta equals pi over four. So all of these points certainly qualify, but then I can move up in z on an all, all of these points qualify. I can move up here and I can move down in z, right? So what I get is a plane this entire plane. It keeps going that way, keeps going that way, keeps going this way. It doesn't go that way because rho is not negative. So rho has to be from zero um, on. And so we therefore get a plane, a half, I should say a half plane technically, but it's still a plane. Um, and how about, what about phi? What if I do phi equals, let's say pi over four? Well, remember that phi is measured from the positive z axis. So here I'm saying, I'm gonna go pi over four in this positive z axis away, phi equals pi over four. Um, and I am not told how far to go, uh, how far to go uh, from the origin. So I can go here, I can go here, I can go here. So I generate this entire line. And then also if it's very hard to picture this, but I'm not told what theta is. So, you know, it's also pi over four away this way. And, you know, pi over four away in the forward direction this way. So basically what I get is this cone that keeps going upward and you know back that way and forward this way forever. So that is just a very, very quick, three quick examples 
to get you used to how you visualize polar coordinate graphs and polar coordinates. Again, we will do much more when we start doing triple integrals of polar coordinates. So what I want to do next is talk about, you know, setting that up. And the first thing to do there is talk about the quote unquote area and volume elements. In other words, what does DA look like in polar coordinates? DA is of course what we integrate over a function of two variables over some region R when we do double integrals. Um, and what does DV look like in spherical coordinates? Spherical. That is the volume element when we integrate a function of three variables in a triple integral. <clears throat> Um, so we want to figure out what these volume and area elements look like in these polar coordinates because, you know, when we do double integrals, for example, we're always doing dx dy or dy dx. And remember when we first started doing this in the lesson 10, I believe, we were thinking about rectangular domains. Okay, in polar coordinates now, we're not thinking about rectangles. We're thinking about uh, generally circles and um, but what I'm going to call here polar rectangles. So we want to convert dx dy to something involving r and theta. Some dr times d theta, or maybe some other factor times dr d theta. So that's kind of where we're heading. Um, the, the first thing I want to do there to get us there in the next module is talk about polar rectangles. So what are these polar rectangles? Um, because we've kind of started from scratch, in the sense that we changed the coordinate system. You know, we were working in Cartesian, and then from there we did Riemann sums, from there we did integrals, and then double integrals. We're gonna kind of repeat all that, but just a little bit more condensed. So now we've converted over to polar coordinates. We're talking about R and theta. Um, what are the simplest kind of shapes in polar coordinates that we could think about? Well, here is one that's gonna be especially useful for the purposes of integration. So polar rectangle. Um, what is a polar rectangle? So, polar rectangle is a region R where I have points in polar form such that R is between A and B and theta is between alpha and beta. So let's draw this out. I'm, I'll just assume that all of these numbers, parameters here are positive. Okay, so R is between A and B. So think of R, let's say R is between like one and two. So you're at a distance between one and two away from the origin. Great. And then let's think of alpha and beta as, you know, let's say this one is um, pi over uh, six and this one is pi over three. So pi over six is 30 degrees and pi over, uh, pi over three is um, 60 degrees. Okay, so then what do I, uh, what sort of region do I have? So I start over here at like 30 degrees uh, and then I end up over here at 60 degrees. And then that's, these are all um, distance one. Then I start over here at uh, 30 degrees distance two, and I, I do this much, and then I end up over here, distance two. So you can see that I'm kind of sweeping out this region. I'll put it in a different color, make it easier to see. I'm sweeping out this region here. Okay. You can now see why this is called a polar rectangle. It's kind of the closest, it's like the analog of a rectangle, but in polar coordinates. You know, this would be a honest to goodness, a rectangle. Um, and now what we're doing is because the way polar works is if you keep the radius, the R fixed and you vary theta, then you are just going a certain, you're sweeping out an arc along a circle. Uh, and then if you change the R, but you keep that new R fixed and you vary theta, we're sweeping out another arc. And then you enclose these and that's kind of the simplest analog uh, of a rectangle in polar coordinates. So this is a, an example, an illustration of a polar rectangle. Okay, so now what about a spherical wedge? To think about a spherical wedge, let's follow a similar approach here. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll warn you now that the diagram I'm about to draw is gonna get a little cluttered, so bear with me. But let's think about an example where um, rho up here from the definition of the spherical wedge, looking at this, Rho is going to vary, let's say, between 1 and 2. And let's do theta varying between pi over 4 and pi over 3. So 45 degrees and 60 degrees. 
Um, and then let's think about uh, phi varying from, how about um, pi over three, uh, let's do pi over six first, to pi over three. So this is 30 degrees to 60 degrees. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff going on. So as I mentioned, this diagram that I'm about to draw will get a little clunky, but hopefully um, you'll see what it looks like. Um, maybe what I'll do in anticipation of what this diagram is, diagram is gonna look like is illustrate for you very quickly what a spherical wedge looks like. So a spherical wedge looks pretty much like this. Um, it is a three-dimensional version of what this polar region kind of looks like. So that is a very rough outline of what a spherical wedge is. And what's going on here? Um, this is a value for R, and this is another value for R. So my origin here is somewhere around over here. Uh, and then we have the rest of the origin there. Uh, and then this is over here, some change in theta, because I'm going that way. Um, and then this extends over here, some change in phi, because I'm going away from the z-axis in an angular direction. So this is what I'm going to attempt to draw up here with all of these parameters. We'll see how it works. So how would I draw the spherical wedge given by all of this information up here? Okay, so the first thing I would say is, well, um, theta is between 45 and 60 degrees. So between 45 and 60 degrees. So this is the extent of the wedge in the theta direction. Um, and then rho is between one and two. So um, if I, well, I'll, I'll go to phi first to make it a little less cluttered. Uh, phi goes from 30 to 60 degrees. So here's 30 degrees in phi, and here's maybe 60 degrees in phi. Okay, so, so I have this part, and um, I'm going to try to draw it a bit more accurately, sitting over. There we go. So think of, think of uh, 60 degrees as over here, and 30 degrees as over there. So this is 30 degrees, and then this is 60 degrees. Um, and then this little region up here, same deal. 30 degrees will stop there, let's say, and 60 degrees will stop there. And then let's um, consider these two line segments to be the distance one from the origin. And then we'll draw um, two line segments that go out, um, one that's two distance away from the origin, and the other one that extends this one two away from the origin. So there is my first, my first um, arc. And all of this, you know, would, would be along the, the line uh, at a radial angle of pi over four from the x-axis on the xy plane. As I mentioned, this diagram gets cluttered. And then I sweep out in this direction of theta to get to this one right there. And then I go up to the um, original part that was the cousin, if you will, of this. Um, and then I go outward, or I should say, I have already gone outward. So the sweep out was back here down this way, and then this kept going up here. Okay, so, so there we go. This is the back portion of my wedge and the front portion of my wedge. So if you can see that, here is the wedge that I have tried very hard to draw, somewhat successfully, somewhat unsuccessfully. <laughs> um, so that is what we call a spherical wedge. Um, if you think of it, as if you held in your hand an eraser, um, which, you know, it could just be a, a cube, one of the boxes we were working with. And then you bend this part backwards and you bend this part backwards and that generates a shape like what I had drawn here. That is the prototypical spherical wedge. And again, why do these things matter? These things matter because as we will see in the next modules video, they are the polar rectangle and the spherical wedge are the area elements that we had talked about, the DAs and the DVs that we're gonna to use to integrate in double and triple integrals. Okay, so um, I'll just scroll down. You can see that we're gonna review that, talk about that in the next video. So in this video, we've talked about polar coordinates. 
spherical coordinates. The ways to convert back and forth between them are here. Um, I'm going to assume that you are familiar, much more familiar with polar coordinates, and especially in graphing and polar coordinates. We'll need some of that content. We won't need all of it for the double and triple integral content that we do in the rest of this lesson. Um, we will learn to graph in spherical coordinates, get more um, comfortable with that as the lesson progresses. This is a way to convert back and forth between rectangular and spherical coordinates. And then in terms of polar rectangles, you know, this is, you know, approaching the boundary of my artistic skills. Polar rectangles uh, look like generalized versions of rectangles, just in a sort of circular feel. And a spherical wedge is kind of like the polar rectangle in 3D, if that makes any sense. So again, we will use this content in the next lesson where we'll build on it. So I'll see you then.